Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru, and after the RX 6500 XT's absolutely disastrous launch last week, today we are checking out something I hope is going to be a bit better. I am of course referring to the RTX 3050, which is actually Nvidia's first sub £300 RTX GPU, and it's coming in with an MSRP of $249 or 239 Great British Pounds. The 3050 was of course initially announced at CES 2022, but I think it's fair to say Nvidia were pretty light on the details, so we'll kick off with a quick spec overview. The first thing to know is that the RTX 3050 is using a cut down version of the GA106 GPU, which is also used to power the RTX 3060. So the 3050 has just 20 streaming multiprocessors, giving us a total of 2560 CUDA cores, while there's also one RT core per SM. We can also note 80 tensor cores and 80 texture units. Boost clock is kept the same as the RTX 3060 at 1777 MHz, though the 8GB of DDR6 memory is clocked fractionally slower at 14 gigabits a second. Across the 128-bit memory interface, that gives total memory bandwidth hitting 224 GB a second. Interestingly as well, for the first time that I can remember with a desktop GPU from Nvidia, the PCIe allocation has also been cut down. So instead of PCIe 4.0 by 16, instead we have a PCIe 4.0 by 8 interface. Now for a GPU of this class with 8GB of G6 memory, I really wouldn't expect this to make much difference. But then again, considering all the extra PCIe testing we did last week for the 6500 XT, I only felt it was fair we should do the same for NVIDIA. That means for all of our game benchmarks, you're going to see two entries for the 3050, one tested on PCIe 4.0, and then one tested on PCIe 3.0. All of this testing was done using our test system provided to us by CyberPower. So this is based around Intel's i9-12900K CPU, and that is paired with 32GB of Corsair Dominator Platinum RGB memory, DDR5 that is, clocks at 5200MHz. That's plugged into the MSI Z690 Carbon Wi-Fi motherboard. Resizable bar is also used on all supported GPUs. You may have already seen as well from some of the B-roll that today we do have two 3050 models to look at. The first is the Gigabyte RTX 3050 Eagle, which is a reference clock card, but then we also have the factory overclocked Palette RTX 3050 Storm XOC. For the bulk of our games testing today, we are going to be focusing on the Gigabyte Eagle, just because that is the reference clocked card, but later on in the video, we will compare the two. We'll look at differences in terms of the cooling, acoustics, and gaming performance. The only other thing to say then before we get into it is that in this video I'm going to be focusing on the 1080p performance but we did also test 1440p so if you want to look at those charts you'll find them on the written review over on kickguru.net which will also be linked down in the description. For now though let's get into the benchmarks. Starting with Assassin's Creed Valhalla then. At 1080p, we can see the RTX 3050 delivers 63 FPS on average. That puts it pretty neatly between the GTX 1660 Super and the RTX 2060 6GB, as it's 8% faster than the 1660 Super, but 11% slower than the 2060. We can also see no practical difference when testing with PCI 3.0 in this game. As for Cyberpunk 2077, it is a pretty similar situation overall. The RTX 3050 is beating out the GTX 1660 Super by 6%, though in practice that's actually only a difference of 3 FPS, so it's hardly a game changer. The 3050 is also a decent amount slower than the RTX 2060, coming in 17% behind, but again we're seeing no difference when dropping PCI speeds down to PCIe Gen 3. Moving on to Death Stranding though, this game puts the RTX 3050 even closer to the GTX 1660 Super, and in fact the 3050 is marginally slower, but we're talking about less than a single frame, so I'd say these cards are just as fast as each other. That said, using the 3050 with PCIe 3.0 did see a reduction in performance. It was only slight, but the 1% lows came down by 6%, which is definitely outside of our margin for error. 
It's more of the same in Far Cry 6 as well. Once more, the RTX 3050 is just about slower than the 1660 Super, but there's really not a lot in it. Looking at the PCI 3.0 results, however, the average frame rate is down 7% compared to PCI 4.0, making it not much faster than the GTX 1650 Super if you do have a PCIe Gen 3 platform. We can see the RTX 3050 creeping back ahead of the 1660 Super in Forza Horizon 5, where it averages 76 FPS, which isn't bad at all. That makes it 12% slower than the RTX 2060, though frame rates do also drop by around 5% for the RTX 3050 when using PCIe 3.0. It's only a small decrease granted, but it's not nothing. Hitman 3, meanwhile, sees the RTX 3050 comfortably beating the GTX 1660 Super, this time by a 13% margin, which is actually the biggest difference we will see today. Compared to the RTX 2060, it is just 10% slower on average, and PCIe bandwidth makes basically no difference in this game as well. Up next then is Horizon Zero Dawn, where we're looking at an average frame rate almost hitting 70 FPS for the RTX 3050. That still puts it closer to the GTX 1660 Super than it does to the RTX 2060, but performance is decent enough. PCIe bandwidth doesn't make a big difference to the RTX 3050 here either, which honestly I have to say was a bit surprising to me, as I do remember a fair bit of drama around PCIe bandwidth when this game first came out, but it is good news for prospective 3050 buyers. Likewise, in Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, PCIe bandwidth makes no difference, with average frame rates for the RTX 3050 coming in just under 70 FPS. That puts it firmly behind the RTX 2060 though, and it's barely ahead of the GTX 1660 Super, beating the latter of those two cards by less than a 5% margin. As for Red Dead Redemption 2, this game shows us basically the same thing. We're talking small improvements over the GTX 1660 Super, with the 3050 just a handful of frames faster, while the RTX 2060 is a good 13% faster. We can't complain about overall performance, but we would have hoped for slightly more over two years on from the 1660 Super. Moving on to Resident Evil Village then, as expected from this game, frame rates are very high indeed. Even at maximum settings, we're seeing over 90 FPS on average for the RTX 3050. It's 8% faster here than the GTX 1660 Super, but still 13% slower than the RTX 2060. As for Total War Saga Troy, however, this is actually the game where we see the biggest hit to performance when testing the RTX 3050 with PCIe Gen 3 speeds. It's 13% slower here on PCIe 3.0 compared to PCIe 4.0, meaning the GTX 1650 Super is actually the faster card on a PCIe Gen 3 platform. On a PCIe 4.0 platform though, the 3050 is on par with the GTX 1660 Super, averaging just around 72 FPS. Lastly, we have Watch Dogs Legion, and by now the results are not a surprise. The 3050 is only a handful of frames faster than the 1660 Super, while it's a solid 12% slower than the 2060. We can also see a small difference when testing on PCIe 3.0 as well, with performance dropping by 4% on average. After all of those benchmarks then, I think it's safe to say we have a pretty good idea as to how the 3050 performs, but before we come to our average performance summary, I just want to recap on the difference made by the PCIe bandwidth. Here we can see performance of PCIe 3.0 relative to PCIe 4.0 then, and in most games we tested, there's not much in it at all. However, in three games, we can see a difference of over 5% when dropping down to PCIe 3.0, with Total War Saga Troy being the biggest offender. It is far from catastrophic like we saw for the RX 6500 XT, which was significantly slower across the board with PCI 3.0, but it is definitely something to keep in mind for the RTX 3050. As for our 12 game average frame rates then, it's not a surprise to see the RTX 3050 is 5% faster than the 1660 Super, though that does drop to basically nothing 
if testing the 3050 on PCIe 3.0. Comparing the 3050 to the RTX 2060, the RTX 3050 comes in 14% slower on average, so it is a decent chunk behind the 2060. Meanwhile, we can also see AMD's RX 6600, so this is the non-XT model. That card is a solid 32% faster than the RTX 3050, despite the MSRP only being 25% higher, but as we know, MSRP doesn't mean anything these days. I do also want to quickly touch on ray tracing. After all, the RTX 3050 is NVIDIA's first GPU of this class to have RTX support. But that being said, I'm honestly not sure how many people will want to turn it on. It can do a decent job when using lower RT quality settings like we can see in Cyberpunk and Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition, but also turning on DLSS goes a long way to making things more playable. Generally though, we are looking at RT performance below the RTX 2060, so I wouldn't say it's a killer addition for the 3050, but at least you can enable the technology without absolutely tanking the frame rate. I would argue though that DLSS is actually going to be a much bigger selling point for the 3050. To go ahead and illustrate the difference it makes, I've actually gone and re-benchmarked a few different games at both 1080p and 1440p using DLSS quality mode, so it's a best case scenario for using DLSS. Now of course image quality does play an absolutely huge role in this discussion, and we have done a bunch of in-depth analysis pieces comparing native resolution to DLSS quality mode, so I definitely recommend checking out some of those on the channel. That being said, there is no denying DLSS can make an absolutely massive difference to your frame rate, and we can see that in Cyberpunk at 1080p. Here we're looking at a performance uplift of 53% over native resolution, and it's also pretty much the difference between a fairly choppy and unpleasant experience compared to making the game super playable if we step up to 1440p. Now the gains aren't always going to be that big as we can see here in Horizon Zero Dawn, but an extra 28% is definitely not to be scoffed at. Plus, the relative performance increase actually jumps up to a 42 boost to our frame rates at 1440p. And then in Watch Dogs Legion, we can see a 22% increase to frame rates at 1080p, which actually takes the RTX 3050 above the RTX 2060's native performance. Lastly, up at 1440p, the RTX 3050 can now hit over 60 FPS when using DLSS quality mode, which is a boost to our frame rate of 32%. Stepping away from our gaming benchmarks though, it's time to change gear and take a quick look at the two different GPU models we are examining today. The first of these is the Gigabyte Eagle, a reference clock card with a dual fan design. The overall shroud is basically identical to the other Eagle cards we have looked at in the past, though compared to the RX 6500 XT Eagle from last week, this one is noticeably bigger, measuring 213mm long and 120mm tall, though it is still a standard dual slot thickness. Power comes from a single 8-pin connector, while we get two DisplayPort 1.4 and two HDMI 2.1 video outputs. The other model we're looking at today is Palette's Storm X OC, shipping with a 30 MHz factory overclock. If you saw our RTX 3060 Storm X review, you will recognize the design as it is exactly the same, meaning this is an absolutely tiny mini ITX card with a single 100mm fan. It measures just 170 millimeters long and is 125 millimeters tall while also requiring a single 8-pin power connector. Video outputs meanwhile consist of three DisplayPort 1.4 and then one HDMI 2.1 connectors. If we start by comparing these two cards in a handful of games, you can immediately see why we didn't benchmark both cards in every single game we tested. There's just a 30 MHz difference between the two, so performance is basically identical. In fact, we didn't see more than a 1% marginal difference across all of our testing, so we can safely say both of these cards are as fast as each other. That's also borne out with our clock speed testing, where the Palette Storm XOC does run fractionally faster, 
but only very, very slightly. In fact, averaged over our 30 minute stress test, the Storm X OC hit 1902 megahertz compared to 1876 megahertz for the Gigabyte Eagle. So again, we're talking very marginal differences. Interestingly though, the Storm X OC is actually the cooler running card. Both saw the GPU peak at 65C, but the Storm X OC actually saw a four degree reduction to the hotspot temperature. The Storm X is even the quieter card, with fan noise hitting 35 decibels compared to 37 decibels for the Gigabyte Eagle. Admittedly, neither of those are massive differences, but considering the palette is clearly the smaller card, this is interesting behavior. The reason for that, however, does become more obvious when we disassemble the cards. So as it turns out, the Eagle's heatsink uses just a single copper heat pipe, and that makes direct contact with the GPU die. The Storm X OC, meanwhile, has a total of three heat pipes, and the GPU contacts with a base plate, while its heatsink fins are also a little denser. Like we say, there's not much between these two cards in terms of thermals and noise, but the extra two heat pipes definitely help the Storm X OC. Moving on to GPU power draw though, for this we're using Nvidia's PCAT tool, so this measures power draw of just the graphics card only, so we're not looking at total system power draw. What you can see here now then is the 12 game average power draw figure at 1080p, just looking at the Gigabyte Eagle. Averaged over our test suite, the RTX 3050 drew 119 watts, which is just fractionally below the GTX 1660 Super, but above the RX 5500 XT 8 gigabyte. That power draw figure means overall efficiency when looking at performance per watt is roughly the same as the RTX 3060, but honestly, it's not much better than the GTX 1650 Super when we would have hoped for more. Compared to the GTX 1660 Super, we do get 7% more performance per watt, but that's hardly significant. The last area I'm gonna to touch on then is gonna be manual overclocking, and here we did test both cards. So for the Gigabyte Eagle, we were able to add 235 megahertz to the GPU and 1350 megahertz to the memory. The Palette Storm XOC, however, doesn't actually have an adjustable power slider, so we're locked at 130 watts. This card didn't overclock as well because of that, but we still managed an extra 210 megahertz to the GPU and 1320 megahertz to the memory. Those overclocks saw the Gigabyte Eagle averaging over 2100 megahertz in the real world in terms of its GPU frequency, with the Palet Storm X sitting about 25 megahertz behind. As for our real world benchmarks, we saw performance increases of between 8 to 11% which certainly isn't bad at all and shows there is some headroom left for the RTX 3050, particularly evident in Hitman 3, where we saw a boost of over 10 frames a second. So that brings us to the end of our RTX 3050 review, and straight away we can say, no, it's not a disastrous product, unlike the 6500 XT, which honestly was a complete dumpster fire. The 3050 really will serve you significantly better across the board, and it hasn't been gimped in several areas. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's good though, just that it's not dreadful. Overall, I'd say it's an okay graphics card, but it's really more in keeping with the likes of the RX 6600 and the RX 6600 XT, cards which I would describe as pandemic GPUs. What I mean by that is it's been released into a market where basically anything will sell, so there's just no real incentive for Nvidia to try that hard. If we were in a fiercely competitive market, however, I would definitely have hoped for bigger gains than an average 5% improvement over the GTX 1660 Super, and that's a card which launched over two years ago. Now don't get me wrong, the 1660 Super is still a very solid card, so the 3050's performance isn't dreadful, it's just we're not moving forward. Instead, rasterized performance really has stagnated. Of course, the 3050 does offer hardware-accelerated ray tracing, and there's an extra two gigabytes of VRAM, 
but you also have to remember DLSS, which really can boost your frame rates massively. So yeah, I would say it is a better product than the 1660 Super, just not by as much. The margins aren't as big as I really would have hoped after over two years. Making things worse though is the fact we are hearing, in the UK at least, launch day stock is going to be extremely limited with hardly any cards on track to hit the £239 MSRP. After those initial bats of MSRP cards do sell out as well, prices are expected to rise significantly. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised to see cards hitting £350, maybe even £400 in the coming weeks. Considering that second-hand 1660 Supers seem to sell between £290 and £370 on eBay UK, that is definitely something to keep in mind. Brand new RX 6600s are also in stock at £440, and that GPU is over 30% faster than the RTX 3050, so if prices do creep up over £350, that is also going to be one to consider. Anyway guys, that is where I am going to leave this review. If you liked it, as always, please do toss me a thumbs up and let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. You can also subscribe if you haven't already and ding that notification bell. And why not come chat with us over on our Discord server, which is linked in the description. While there, you can also find a link to our merch store and you can even consider backing us on Patreon, where you can see some of our content early and get access to exclusive giveaways. That is it for this one though guys, I'm Dominic for Kiguru and I'll see you in the next video.